Before Ethel and Bobby became serious, he had taken out Pat Skakel on a number of occasions and found the two sisters as different as night and day. Anyway, according to some, Pat Skakel wasn't interested in Bobby, whom she viewed as immature, tedious, and intellectually inferior. Some Manhattanville girls maintained that Ethel was jealous of Pat's involvement with Bobby, no matter how uninspired it might have been. That with Jean's backing, Ethel aggressively elbowed Pat out of the picture. Anne Marie O'Hagan Murphy felt Pat, quote, was crazy about Bobby. And in some way or another, Ethel, I don't know if I should say stole him away, but Bobby's affections were turned toward Ethel. We felt it was always peculiar for the younger sister to steal the bow from the older sister, if that's what happened. It was a big talk at Manhattanville that Ethel was now dating Bobby instead of Pat. People were angry. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. We're going to keep going in The Other Mrs. Kennedy today, and we have three chapters we're reading today. I ran through them last episode. Um, they are entitled Rich Girls. They weren't joking either. It's really fun to hear how they spent their money. Chasing Boys. And then the last chapter for today is called Bobby Kennedy. So it's a little bit of a shorter chapter, but I think that kind of reading it in chunks like this just makes it a little bit more manageable to listen to. All right. Chapter 27, Rich Girls. Each class has its in crowd, and Ethel was it in the class of 1949, observed Nancy Davis Sweeney, a Manhattanville tennis player. In freshman year, about a dozen affluent girls were part of Ethel's circle. They set themselves apart from the goody goods, who did the nuns' bidding. Deciding their elite group needed a name, Ethel suggested the Twelve Apostles, after the original disciples of Christ who were sent out to preach the gospel. Unlike the indigence and privation of the apostles, Ethel's crowd had one major common denominator, money. They were the privileged daughters of wealthy bankers and lawyers, cotton kings and oil barons, ranchers and industrialists, securities brokers and inventors. Coddled by their parents, pampered by servants, few could handle the simplest task. Ethel, for one, didn't know how to cook an egg or how to iron a blouse. One of her closest pals once took expended flash bulbs rather than film to the drugstore to be developed. Interesting. We were very clicky clicky, said a member of the group years later. We were more fun loving than the other girls were, the real studious types. We thought we were the swiftest ones. We thought we were very cool. Jean Cassidy Duffy, one of some 30 cadet nurses whose education at Manhattanville was funded by the U.S. government as part of the war effort, remembered the circle as snobbish. Quote, their group thought we were working girls, not quite up to snuff. They came from privileged backgrounds and they felt they wanted to be around privileged people. Ethel and Jean were the nucleus of that group. Some members of Ethel's circle, looking back years later, expressed regret over the treatment accorded the sole black girl in the class of 1949. June Mulvaney Romain was a Russian-German language major, a scholarship student, a member of the interracial club, who went home every day to Brooklyn, a day hop, as such non-boarding students were termed. On the whole, we girls weren't always nice to her, observed Margaret Adams. She was a lovely girl, but we ignored her. We certainly didn't embrace her. Campus activist Abby Ann Day Lynch, who lived across the hall from Ethel and Jean during junior and senior years, said admission of blacks to Manhattanville was the burning political issue on campus during the class of 49's tenure, but that Ethel and her crowd had shown little interest in participating. I knew June Mulvaney pretty well, said Lynch. It was a question of trying to make her feel comfortable in a white ocean. Ethel's group was indifferent at best. It wasn't so much a question of, we don't want you here, as... Why should we get involved in this? It's okay for the school to decide to integrate, but what's it got to do with us? We'll go on with our friends anyway. Lynch remembered having at least one informal meeting with Ethel and her friends to discuss the racial issue. But I figured it wouldn't pay off, that it might even make it worse. Partially, their disinterest came from being sheltered, more sheltered than some, living within their own kind of cocoon and social circumstances. They hadn't been educated to think about it. Years later, after her marriage to the politically liberal Bobby Kennedy, Ethel showed a marked and very public interest in civil rights and human rights causes, surprising those who were aware of her youthful apathy and insensitivity to such issues. So, just to pause real quick. <clears throat> it's interesting to me because in the previous chapter, they went to some lengths uh, to describe Manhattanville as a place that wanted to be known as people who were basically white saviors. They, they made the girls pledge things like, I'm never going to use the N-word again, and when I get on a bus, I'm going to sit next to a black person. It's like, 
yeah, I, I, I mean, do we need to pledge these things? Is this news to you that you would not use the N word or that if there's an empty seat in a bus that happens to be next to a black person that you are, you're so nice that you're willing to take that seat. Like to me, it was like, don't pat yourself on the back. That's like being like, I promise I won't kick a puppy and I promise not to drown a baby. Yeah, duh. What are you talking about? Are you supposed to be a better human being because you would be willing to do those things? So Manhattanville, I feel like, wanted the world to look at them as a sort of progressive school that was taking stances and racial injustice that was, you know, running rampant throughout the culture that they were going to, you know, they were going to be the shining beacon on a hill that doesn't use the N-word. It's like, don't do yourself any favors. Anyway, the reality was that we had people like this who when they actually have a black student in the school, ignore her. And not that everybody ignored her. It was, you know, it's not saying everybody turned their back on poor June. But at the same time, there were definitely cliques of people who actively, you know, left others out. And on the one hand, you want to say, well, it's youthful ignorance. And, uh, you know, they hadn't been educated to think about other people other than themselves. And I think that it's fair to say that most of us looking back weren't who we hoped to be, you know, early college days, you know, immature, didn't think about other people. Um, so my criticism isn't necessarily even for Ethel and her group of friends, because it would have been awesome if they had decided to embrace a student who probably did feel a little left out in a sea of people who didn't look anything like her and who came from backgrounds that probably weren't like hers. It would have been awesome if Ethel could have imagined what she felt like and tried to bring her into a circle. Not that you have to be best friends with everybody, but just, you know, don't ignore people when they walk by. Um... But I think it is asking a little bit too much of it, people. Should, I guess what I'm trying to say is people shouldn't be surprised when you see what somebody was like in college and say, wow, they had a lot of problems. Yeah, so did I in college. Like I was the worst. And so I just kind of think that for anybody to say it's really interesting that she cared about civil rights later and not when she was younger. Yeah, well, people are allowed to grow and mature. And nothing bothers me more than when somebody wants to compare what somebody was like as an ignorant child and then who they are later in life and say, hmm, some disparages, some differences. That's interesting. Why didn't she always care? Because she grew up and matured, you know? And I would say that there's a lot of people who go to college who are, you know, just rearing to be an activist and rearing to feel important in the world and to find their cause. But then there's a lot of people like Ethel and her group that just want to go and have a good time. They aren't very politically aware, nor do they want to be. And I think that actually both tracks can be a little bit detrimental because on the one hand, you're young and stupid and most of the time don't really know the uh, forces to which you are attaching yourself. So many times these activists uh, come rip roaring in and they you know, feel very strong, passionately about a thing because they heard a story one time. And sometimes their fervor and their you know, zealotry is a little bit off base. And then you've got the people who are, you know, intellectually and politically lazy and don't want to know what's going on in the world. And that's wrong too. But I, hopefully as we grow older, we kind of find a spot in the middle where we're not just going crazy because we heard this one-off story and we're not politically and intellectually lazy. But to criticize, I think either side is to be unfair to who you are in your early twenties. Dumb. Okay. Continuing. From her mother, Ethel learned to appreciate the finer things in life. See, because this is why Ethel doesn't care about politics because she's got money to spend. Like began, Ethel spent George Giggles' money with abandon. George had always coddled Ethel, giving her as much spending money as she wanted. By the time Ethel got to college, she'd become a world-class shopper and clothes horse. She fancied expensive dresses, suits, coats, and accessories, and, like her mother, often made quantity purchases, getting the wholesale price when and where she could. While she dressed preciously collegiate, cashmere sweaters, Shetland wool skirts, her closets also overflowed with stunning apparel from the best shops on Fifth Avenue. She had gowns and evening dresses costing thousands of dollars alongside her muddy gabardine leather and suede riding garb. Few of her friends knew that Ethel, a tomboy on the surface, wore satin and lace lingerie that was sewn by the family seamstress at Lake Avenue. Manhattan girls were supposed to be well-dressed, said Kay Simpson Waterbury, but it was almost sinful to spend $3,000 on a dress as Ethel would. She had beautiful purses and accessories. I remember arguments among the girls about Ethel spending because we were taught by the nuns that it was very wrong to spend lots and lots of money on clothes. $3,000 for one dress as a college student would be 
unbelievable even now. But $3,000 in 1949? Somebody do the calculations. Waterbury's roommate, Courtney Murphy Benost, once described as Vogue fashion plate, said that Ethel had terrific taste. Ethel went to extremes at times, fashion-wise. On campus, she often wore a ratty old double-breasted camel hair coat, belted in the back, with white pearl buttons over her ugly blue gym suit. The war had caused one major disappointment for Ethel. She couldn't buy expensive shoes, which she loved. Ethel had a long-time shoe fetish, but leather was being used for combat boots, not high heels. Restrictions and rationing had been in effect for the duration, so the stylish had difficulty finding fashionable footwear. But with the conflict over, chic, extravagantly priced shoes were returning to the marketplace. One Saturday, Ethel decided to stock up, dragging Anne Marie O'Hagan Murphy to the most elegant shoe salon on Fifth Avenue. There on the shelves, just arrived, were the latest sling-back, toeless platform alligator high heels. They were very, very expensive and very, very sexy, said Murphy. Nobody would be ostentatious enough to own them, especially a girl in her sophomore year at a Catholic college. She just wouldn't. They were the kind of shoes a mother would own. But Ethel said, I love them. So she giggled, took out her checkbook, and bought them in red, green, black, and blue. Four pairs. I almost flipped. One weekend, Anne Marie accompanied Ethel to Manhattan's garment district to buy what she thought would be a single hat. In those days, we wore hats and gloves when we went out, she said. Ethel's mother had told her to go to one particular millinery showroom, where she'd arranged for the Skagel girls to buy it wholesale. Ethel spent an hour trying on hats before buying at least ten. She knew no stops, whether it to be how she drove her car or how she spent her money. At Andre de Printemps, an exclusive hair salon on Fifth Avenue, she convinced the owner to give her a discounted college rate after having intimated that she was just a poor Catholic schoolgirl, couldn't afford to spend more. She then charmed him into offering the same low rate to her rich college pals. The most extreme example of penny pinching by this rich girl from Greenwich, who thought nothing of spending hundreds on shoes, was how she routinely conned the toll taker on the Triborough Bridge out of paying the toll. I remember us dashing off campus on Friday afternoons in Ethel's station wagon, said Kay Simpson Waterbury. Ethel never had any cash on her, so she'd always have some wonderful story to tell the man in the toll booth. She'd say she was going to pray for him, and he was going to get anything he wanted in the world if he'd let her cross that bridge without paying the toll. And it worked every time. Let's deal with this toll taker. Who cares? Like, what, did he just encounter a saint that her prayer should mean so much? Okay, so that's the end of that chapter about the wild spending of Bethel and her friends. Uh, and then this chapter is called Chasing Boys. And it is sort of like uh, descriptive of how Ethel approached boys and how they approached her. Ethel often joined her chums in the search for eligible young men, but she wasn't terribly enthusiastic about the hunt or making the catch. It's not that she didn't like men. She thoroughly enjoyed their company and would have close male friends throughout her life. She'd grown up surrounded by handsome, boisterous brothers, so she felt comfortable around men. But few young college women were sexually active in those days, especially girls from Catholic schools like Manhattanville, girls with deep religious beliefs, girls who were taught to believe that sexual thoughts, let alone acts, were immoral and sinful. Sister Mary Biles, who lectured the girls on the subject of dating and mating, later claimed 99% of them were virgins. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Ethel would never pursue sex just for pleasure. Sex, Ethel would always believe, was for making babies. Ethel tended to catch men's eyes with her daring antics and her athletic prowess. While she had crushes, they were those of starstruck adolescents rather than a sexually mature young woman. Ethel was always like a buddy, a pal, said a male friend who had known her throughout her life. She was fun, but she didn't stir man's blood. Prior to falling for Bobby, Ethel was crazy about equestrian Billy Steinkraus. Besides Bobby, there was never anybody in Ethel's life that I could see except maybe Billy, said Kay Simpson Waterbury. He was the only one that she had a crush on. Billy cut a nice figure on a horse, and Ethel was always admiring him, saying how wonderful he was. But most of the time, when she talked about men like that, it was all jokey-jokey. Ethel was 12, and Steinkraus was 15 when they first met, competing against each other at horse events in Greenwich, in Fairfield County, and on Long Island. The son of the chairman of Bridgeport Brass, and a one-time president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Steinkraus lived in nearby Westport, but went to Greenwich County Day, Brunswick, and rode at Round Hill. So he got to know the young Skakels well. 
His education at Yale was interrupted by the war. He enlisted for the horse cavalry, ending up in Burma with mules. After the war, he resumed his show riding career, gaining international prominence as a member of the 1952 U.S. Olympic equestrian team, which won a bronze medal. Refined, handsome, he could have been on the covers of magazines like Country Life, The Sportsman, or Spur, which he consumed with a passion. During college, Ethel and Billy saw each other often at competitions. So smitten was Ethel that she once went to Dublin to watch Don Krause ride in a horse show, but she never made him aware of her feelings. Crush is not the word I'd use, remarked Steinkraus later. We never even dated, but we were together a lot. Ethel wasn't a great beauty, but her eyes were always sparkling and her skin was nut brown in all seasons because she loved the outdoors and she really exuded health and naturalness, so I found her attractive in that way. Steinkraus had also become a friend of young Jackie Bouvier and often rode with her. Comparing the two young women later, he said, Ethel was a real tomboy. As a man, you didn't have to make special allowances for Ethel. You could treat her like a brother. Jackie might burst into tears on some occasion if some behavior had erupted that was not exactly what she thought was appropriate. Ethel and her crowd went looking for eligible young men on ski weekends in Stowe, Vermont, or in the mountains of Quebec. But she seemed so indifferent that she sometimes skied wearing the same old camel hair coat on the slopes that she wore going to and from classes at school. Not a real male attention getter. Ever so often, the handsome cadets from West Point arrived at Manhattanville for a tea dance. Once, the girls took a cab downtown to chic east side and Manhattan clubs, popular with the prep school and the collegiate crowd, places like LaRue for dancing on Fridays or Saturday nights. They often hung out at the German American or the cocktail lounge at the Biltmore. Sometimes for an evening of slumming, they'd venture into Greenwich Village. But traditional society night spots were Ethel's cup of tea, clubs where she could kick up her heels and have fun. She adored the fast dancing, the jitterbugging, the Charleston, that kind of thing, said Kay Waterbury. Ethel was one of the best dancers in the clique. She entered all the contests, and she was the only one to go on the floor in her high heels. The floors were so slippery, but she was the one who ended up excelling and staying out there after everyone else had given up. On Sundays, Ethel's crowd went to the Stork Club, where they'd have brunch and get balloons and door prizes and free samples of perfume. Sometimes the girls checked into rooms at the Biltmore or the Waldorf, paying college rates. Other times, they'd stay at Pat Kennedy's Manhattan apartment when she was out of town. They'd shop or go to movies in the afternoon and get dressed up to go to the clubs at night for innocent flirtations with boys from Princeton, Yale, Harvard, and Georgetown. Most of the girls in Ethel's circle had brothers, so a lot of dates were arranged that way. For instance, Margaret Adams' ebullient, fun-loving brother Bill was in law school at Harvard, so she asked him to arrange dates for herself, Ethel, and Jean. They'd drive up to Boston and check into the Fitzgerald suite. At then they'd get together with Bill and his law school roommates, Day Watts and Jim Kerrigan, who'd graduated from Princeton, and Ross Trapp Hagen from Hale, all of whom were at least five years older than Ethel and her friends. The young men had rooms on the top floor of the Brownstone at Bay Street Road near the Charles River, and when Ethel came to visit, one of her pals, whose father owned a brewery, filled the trunk of Ethel's car with cases of beer, which they'd put on ice in the law student's bathtub. Watts saw Ethel about a dozen times as part of the group, before she and Bobby Kennedy became a steady item. I never had the feeling she and the girls were looking. It was something to do for the weekend. Just a good group of guys and girls, he said. The roommates shared a 1937 seven-passenger LaSalle, the black beauty which the crowd piled into to go to dinner in Cambridge. While Ethel and Watts were just friends, Trap Hagen and Jean Kennedy were kind of an item, said Watts. Ross was very interested in her, but I don't think Jean was quite so interested in him. Neither Ross nor I were Catholic, so that had something to do with it. Trap Hagen agreed that being Catholic was a prerequisite for any serious relationship with girls like Ethel. Jean was a very pretty young Irish girl, he said, but there was no romance. We certainly weren't an item. Trap Hagen said Ethel made little of any impression on him, noting that the Skakels were all a little bit crazy because they had sudden wealth, which they didn't know how to handle except by spending a lot of money and having raucous times. The dates with the girls who were called were prompted by Bill, who was obviously interested in these recognizably important families. Years later, because of these college connections, Bill, a bright, aggressive young lawyer in the hometown of Cincinnati, wrote presidential aspirant Jack Kennedy a long letter expressing his enthusiasm and analyzing the Ohio political situation. His eventual reward was a job as one of Attorney General Robert Kennedy's top assistants at the Justice Department. During those years, he became a close friend of Ethel's. Track Trap Hagen went on to become a managing partner in the prestigious New York firm of Goldman Sachs and married a Norton girl, a friend of Jean's. Years later at a Washington party, his wife would be propositioned by attorney General Bobby Kennedy as Trap Hagen looked on 
in disgust. But back in the late 1940s, the lives of these young people were simpler, wholesome, and high-spirited without such intrigues. One evening in New York City, after a meeting under the clock at the Biltmore, the gang went to the Blue Angel, a jazz club on 52nd Street, where a friend hypnotized Ethel. Throughout the night, the friend kept an eye on Ethel, uncertain as to whether she was susceptible to hypnosis because she was so strong-minded. As they were all leaving, the friend whispered something in Ethel's ear. Turning on her heel, Ethel walked slowly back to their table, which had not yet been cleared, and proceeded to knock a dozen beer bottles to the floor. Without knowing what she'd done, she walked innocently out of the club. What a strange anecdote. And it is, it, you know, it's, it seems like such a simpler time. Meeting under the Biltmore clock, isn't that what they talk about in The Catcher in the Rye? Isn't that referenced? It must have been a thing back then. Okay, this is our last chapter for this episode. It's called Bobby Kennedy. So finally, the Kennedys, the Kennedy match of Ethel and Bobby is finally happening. We're only 104 pages in, but we're ready for the, for the good stuff. Because I kind of want to get to the part where Bobby Kennedy is over here propositioning other people's wives. That's the story I'm here for. Um, is that right and good and appropriate of me? Probably not. But, you know, it's not all good times under the clock of the Billmore. And that's what we're here for. Anyway, I'm not saying we're going to get there today, but crazy is about to happen and I want to be there. Robert Francis Kennedy was the third son and seventh child of Joe and Rose Kennedy. Bobby was born November 20th, 1925 in Brookline, Massachusetts. Rose, who viewed Bobby being number seven in her brood as a lucky sign and a good omen, was having a baby on the average of once every 18 months. We were all happy he was a boy baby after four girls, she said later. It was wonderful for the girls and for us. Not long after he was born, the family moved to a rented home overlooking the Hudson in the Riverdale section of Upper Manhattan, where they lived a short time before Joe Kennedy bought a five-acre estate in Bronxville, Westchester County, a short drive from the city. Bobby became Rose's favorite, a mama's boy. When he once got a miserable grade in a religious course while at a boarding school, Rose wrote him a note lightly scolding him. When the family traveled together, Bobby always sat next to his mother, whom he worshipped. With four sisters born before him, he was lost in a sea of women. His brothers were away at school, his father was involved with business and with other women, and when Joe Kennedy was at home, he was tough and demanding on Bobby. Later, many felt that the adult Bobby was much like his father, not just the same pale blue eyes, but icy, tough, brutal. However, Bobby resembled his mother having the same hawk-like face, hooked nose, and deep-set eyes. When his brothers Jack, whom he would always idolize, and Joe, who showed him the most love and affection, roughhoused together, Bobby hid upstairs with his sisters, sometimes breaking into tears because of the turmoil, hiding his face in his hands. There was fear that he might be unmanly, effeminate. By the time Bobby arrived in 1932, said Rose, Bobby was already more than seven years old. So there it was, with two older brothers and one very much younger, none of whom was much used to him as boyhood pals, playmates. I remember my mother said, he's stuck by himself with a bunch of girls. He'll be a sissy. Bobby was the runt of the family, not handsome like his brothers. He needed to have his teeth straightened. He was often ill. Aren't they always ill? I mean, what? So, so, was, so was Jack Kennedy. And, 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 and so is Rosemary. Rosemary's sick too. They're all ill. The first time Rose sent Bobby to summer camp when he was 12, he came down with pneumonia. Bobby had a lot going against him, said longtime family friend Lem Billings. He was small, shy, uncertain, and lost. He had a hard time asserting himself. Nothing came easy to him, but he never stopped trying. According to Billings, Bobby felt he was the least loved of the Kennedy children, despite his mother's attention. To compensate, he battled to be the best at everything, from his behavior to his Catholicism. Like his mother, like Ethel, Bobby was a daily communicant and would be throughout most of his life. He had his first communion at age seven. He wanted to be an altar boy. He read the Bible. He worked hard at learning Latin. We always had a rosary on the beds, said his sister Pat. Mother would hear our bedtime prayers and do our catechism with us every day for Sunday school. Luella Hennessy, the family nurse, felt for years that Bobby would enter a seminary and become a priest. Bobby once tried to mirror Joe's entrepreneurial spirit by securing a newspaper route, but he couldn't take the daily grind. Mother discovered that he talked the family chauffeur into driving him on his route, making his deliveries in a Rolls Royce. He then came down with what Rose described as summer flu, which ended the short-lived venture. As a teenager, he'd secured a clerking job in a Boston bank, where his father had once worked. As a student, he got poor grades and he hated reading. 
Again, a Kennedy child with poor grades. I thought we were led to believe that the Kennedys were this brilliant set of people whose parents were so strict that they would have trembled in their boots to bring home less than an A+. But yet another child who's not good at school. Where did this rumor come that the Kennedys were this brilliant set of people who had these rousing debates at the dinner table because everyone was just like Einstein? Okay, but anyway, he was a poor student. His brother Jack, on the other hand, read voraciously. Jack's favorite book as a child was Billy Whiskers, a story about a billy goat that featured black people drawn with large red lips, wide noses, and an illustration caption such as, Don't shoot, don't shoot. I's never gonna steal no more your melons. Oh, I'm sorry for that. But also, is Jack to be blamed for having a book that uh, makes derogatory illustrations of black people. Isn't that his parents' fault for buying him a book like that? And a child doesn't know the difference. A child doesn't know that what he's looking at is derogatory. He just thinks the illustrations are fun and the story is interesting and, and funny as far as he knows. I mean, I, I mean, it's like comments like that. It's like, you cannot judge a child for what is brought into their house and what the parents leave lying around for the kids to look at. And if they grow up with this idea that black people are there for your amusement, is that your fault? Because as a child, that's what you were taught and showed by the, the literature that lay around the house? I mean, I feel like we can't really tell that story and act like something was wrong with Jack because that was his favorite book. Can you believe it? I can't believe it because maybe there wasn't somebody around to offer him something better to read. Anyway, Bobby went to the lower schools in Hyannisport, Bronxville, Riverdale. When his father was ambassador, Billy was enrolled in two different schools in London in a short span of time. Schools where at age 13, he wore stiff British uniforms, blazers, and flannel short pants. He hated England, refusing to join the British Boy Scouts because he'd have to swear allegiance to the king. Joe arranged for Bobby to wear an American Scout uniform, get his tenderfoot rank, and attend meetings as a visiting member, which placated the boy. See, but, hmm, it, what do we think about that? Just always making these little arrangements for your son. Like, if he's in England, and then he is, and he's joining the English Boy Scouts, but then he's like wearing a separate uniform and saying separate uh, pledges and, 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 and doing separate things. I mean, I don't know. It's like I, I do appreciate the child's desire to honor his patriotism to his own country. But wouldn't that have just made him stick out all the more? This this kid who comes in and uh, whose dad has made special arrangements for him to wear a separate uniform and to sort of just be this separate entity unto himself. And then we're wondering, why did Bobby Kennedy have a hard time fitting in? Like, that doesn't seem helpful to me that his parents did that. Anyway, it, he continued to have a problem because the press reported on all the Kennedy doings in England, even Bobby's clumsy effort to talk to Princess Elizabeth at a party. When the family returned home, Bobby was shipped off to an assortment of boarding schools, the very strict Portsmouth Priory in Rhode Island, where a couple of the Skakel boys had gone for a time. St. Paul's Protestant Preparatory School in New Hampshire, then in September 1942 to the very Protestant Milton Academy near Boston, where as a 150-pound 18-year-old he made the football team. At Milton, for the first time in his life, Bobby seemed somewhat happy and grounded, but he was still bashful, shy and awkward around girls, and remained a mediocre student. It was during this period that his brother Joe was killed in combat in a PT boat designated 109, carrying his brother Jack, was sliced in half by a Japanese destroyer. After graduating from Milton, Bobby managed to get into Harvard, where his goal was to drop out and get into the war like his brothers. As a student, he joined the Naval Reserve and dreamed of becoming a flyer. His father and Jack would hear none of it. The war had already claimed one son and brother. Bobby lobbied constantly. On his own, he quit the officer's training program with hopes of entering the service as an enlisted man, but it wasn't until the war was officially over that Joe Kennedy decided it was time for his son to serve his country. He used his influence with the Navy Secretary James Forrestal to get Bobby assigned to the newly commissioned destroyer USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. as a seaman's apprentice. His shipboard naval career lasted from February to May of 1946, during which time he was assigned to routine detail on a short Caribbean cruise that included a trip to the U.S. Naval's base in Cuba. With his discharge papers, he was awarded two routine medals and a promotion to seaman second class. He returned to Harvard in the fall of 1946. So, I mean, on the one hand, I can completely understand why his family really wanted to stay stand in the way of his participation in the war. You get one brother who's dead, one brother who's horrifically injured, and to put another son in the war would have felt like... Uh, they would have just felt like dancing with fate in a way that you as a parent would not be interested in doing. I completely understand it. 
And yet, and yet, and yet, for that boy's sake, he had to have been allowed to do the thing that he felt called to do as a man. And it's like, as a parent, it's so, so, so hard to find that spot where you protect your children and yet you let your children do what they need to do in order to become adults in life, in order to test their manhood. Bobby Kennedy should have been allowed to test his manhood, to go and do and participate in a way that he felt called to do as a man, instead of being held back because of something else that had happened outside of his control. His brother dying was not his fault, but he is having to pay the price for a thing that happened, and he is being held back in the expression of his masculinity in order that his parents not be hurt further because of something that happened to his brother. And while I can completely see everybody's side of this, I just pity Bobby for not being allowed to do what his older two brothers had been allowed to do. Everybody's worried that Bobby's going to be some kind of a sissy. He is needing to join the war effort like every other red-blooded male wanted to do, but he can't do it. And then he gets this little assignment on a ship for two months, you know, to sort of like pat him on the head and be like, you did your part too, Bobby, so don't feel bad. He didn't do his part though, not in the way he wanted to. And I think if I were him, I would just have struggled mightily with the bitterness of not being allowed to do what I had wanted to do because I had to bear the burden of the tragedy that happened to my family. And yet I completely understand why the parents were unwilling for him to join. So, I mean, I get it. I'm just sad for him. Anyway, it was during this time that Bobby got a taste of Kennedy-type politics, campaigning in Jack's first Massachusetts congressional race in the 11th District, an Irish and Italian stronghold of Boston. Kennedy won by a landslide, a victory attributable to the financial resources and political clout of his father. Jean had recruited her friend Ethel into the fray, and she, too, took to the streets, handing out Kennedy literature, helping to serve snacks at campaign headquarters. One of Bobby's roommates at the time was George Terrian, two years older, handsome and more worldly, a veteran of the war who had flown dozens of sorties against the Japanese and Navy fighter planes from the aircraft carrier Independence. Bobby and I were very close friends from the beginning, said Terrian years later. You couldn't live with him, but we got along. He was a royal pain in the ass. He was a bulldog about certain things, but I tolerated him. Terrian, who had a lot of influence over Bobby during their college years, grew up in a modest home in New Hampshire. His father, a Harvard-trained lawyer specialized in appellate work, had lost his money in the crash and never recovered financially. A friend remembered George Terrian in college as, quote, very outgoing, friendly, very Irish, and very impressed by the Kennedys' money and position. Bobby and George would eventually room together at the University of Virginia Law School. They'd travel through Europe together, and Terrian would eventually become a central figure in the Skakel family drama, working for George Skakel and marrying one of his daughters, just like Bobby. Besides Terrian, Bobby's only friends at Harvard were other football players. He lacked interest in his studies, and his exam scores showed it. His goal was to make the varsity team and get his Harvard letter, despite being a mediocre player and suffering injuries. Because of his small size, he was bumped to lower squads, but later in the year he made the varsity team and became a member of the varsity club, a decision some of the better players questioned. He was so desperate to be a football hero that he played one game with a broken leg. Or so the legend goes. One has to ask themselves how that's possible, but okay. It was to be this brooding, insecure, highly competitive young man from a powerful and wealthy Catholic family, in many ways like her own, that Ethel Skakel was drawn. Hmm, interesting. I hate to stop there. Do we have time for another? Let's just do one more, shall we? Because now they're going to meet, and this is what we're here for. This chapter is called Man of Her Dreams. Ethel was formally introduced to Bobby by his sister Jean during the winter of their freshman year at Manhattanville. Jean had grown so fond of Ethel that she actually wanted her to become part of the Kennedy family, and so did Ethel, with a vengeance. The two girls, along with various friends and family members, had gone to Quebec for a ski weekend. Jean had strong feelings that Bobby and Ethel would instantly hit it off. But she was wrong. It was actually Jean's brother Jack who made Ethel swoon. Ethel came back to Manhattanville from that ski trip, and she was insane about Jack, recalled Margaret George. She talked, she talked to me about him nonstop. Not just me. The world! She was nuts about him, and she didn't think much of Bobby. Jack's so handsome, so glamorous, she said. Ethel felt Jack had much more wit and pizzazz, and that Bobby was too shy. But a member of Ethel's circle advised, you're definitely not Jack's type. Ethel quickly came to that realization, too. Unlike Bobby, Jack was a man of the world, pursuing glamorous women, about to embark on a triumphant political career. Ethel was a skinny college kid and made no impression on him whatsoever. 
At the time of the ski weekend, Ethel knew Bobby slightly because he'd had occasional informal dates with her sister Pat and had been in and out of the Skakel home. Ethel had also seen him at the Kennedys in Hyannisport and in Palm Beach during visits with Jean. But Bobby never paid much attention to Ethel, and she harbored no secret fantasies about him. It would take a while for the two of them to click. The young Kennedys and Skakels had first bonded when George Ann met Eunice some six years earlier. Later, Pat Kennedy and Pat Skakel were schoolmates and chums at Maplehurst, about the time Ethel was transferring there from Greenwich Academy. Pat Kennedy went on to Manhattanville, joining Eunice. Pat Skakel arrived at the school in 1942, and the Skakel and Kennedy girls became instant friends. As a result, matches were constantly being made between Kennedy boys and Skakel girls and vice versa. At one time or another, there was four Skakels going around with four Kennedys, said Jim Skakel. When you're in the same circle, everybody's moving around, dating each other, and that's what was happening with the Skakels and the Kennedys. Jim was the first Skakel to date a Kennedy, seriously. His romance with Pat lasted about a year. By the time Jim met her, she had blossomed into a chic, glamorous young woman. Jim was immensely attracted to Pat, and their romance flourished. They fell in love, recalled Margaret Adams. But Jim's drinking and flightiness made Pat wary. Later, Jim maintained it was he who finally ended the relationship. But I think Jim would have said that because we've had a lot of quotes from Jim, and I don't think much of him as far as the way he recalls things. I mean, he said a lot of things in remembrance of the way things used to be, and he seems like he just didn't really mature much. Now, I could be completely off my rocker there, and maybe you guys haven't got the same sense from Jim, but he'll remember these, like, crazy things they did, and he'll just laugh about it, like, weren't we the funniest? Weren't we just the bee's knees? And I'm like, no, I don't think so, Jim. Y'all were crazy. Anyway, Jim says he ended it, and it had nothing to do with his drinking. And he said, the Kennedys were too clannish for me. If you went out with one Kennedy, you went out with all of them. So I said, the hell with it. We were just not suited for each other. Is that right, Jim? Okay. At one point, Ethel tried to play Cupid, too, arranging for Jean to date her brother Rushton. Like Jim, he said, I couldn't have handled it. The Kennedys weren't my cup of tea. The reality was that Jean wasn't attracted to the mild-mannered Skakel boy. She was more interested in the handsome Caroon brothers, Larry and Bob, sons of a wealthy and prominent Garden City, Long Island Irish Catholic family in the insurance business. Their beautiful sister, Joan Patricia Caroon, had dated Rushton Skakel for a time, but then George Jr. moved in and he knocked Rushton out and then he married her. There was also hopes that the youngest Kennedy boy, Ted, would get together with the youngest Skakel girl, Anne, who also went to Manhattanville, but she wasn't attracted to him. Would anyone have been? Anne was adamant, recalled Franny Pryor Hawes. She wouldn't have anything to do with Ted. Good for Anne. Jean Kennedy, however, was the catalyst in what became the scandalous marriage between Ted and Joan Bonet, another Manhattanville girl. Before Ethel and Bobby became serious, he had taken out Pat Skakel on a number of occasions and found the two sisters as different as night and day. Pat was quiet while Ethel was loud. Pat garnered respect while Ethel got laughs. Pat was an academic while Ethel was a jock. Pat was also more feminine. Ethel's bedroom at home, which adjoined Pat's, was always a mess, more like a boy's room. Pat's, on the other hand, was soft and refined. French provincial furnishings, white satin on the headboard, wall-to-wall white fur carpeting in her private bathroom. You bad mistake, though. White, white fur carpeting in the private bathroom? How do you keep it nice, like really and truly, even if you were a neat, tidy person? How do you keep white fur carpet nice in a bathroom? What do you step on when you get out of the shower or out of the bathtub? I mean, it just, the care that it would take to keep that nice. And I don't care that that, that white fur that belongs nowhere near a toilet. Anyway, according to some, Pat Skakel wasn't interested in Bobby, whom she viewed as immature, tedious, and intellectually inferior. Pat never really liked Bobby very much, said Pat Norton Mullins, her close friend at Manhattanville. I never felt, whoop, here's Bobby Kennedy, a big romance in Pat's life. Bobby did take Pat to her senior prom in the spring of 1946 at her invitation because there was no one else, said Mullins. It was only a casual thing with Pat, a friendship, and then he started seeing Ethel, agreed Ethel's friend Courtney Murphy Bonoist. Some Manhattanville girls maintained that Ethel was jealous of Pat's involvement with Bobby, no matter how uninspired it might have been, that with Jean's backing, Ethel aggressively elbowed Pat out of the picture. Anne Marie O'Hagan Murphy felt Pat, quote, was crazy about Bobby, and in some way or another, Ethel, I don't know if I should say stole him away, but Bobby's affections were turned toward Ethel. We felt it was always peculiar for the younger sister to steal the bow from the older sister, if that's what happened. 
It was a big talk at Manhattanville that Ethel was now dating Bobby instead of Pat. People were angry. What's it to anybody else? What's going on over there? What are people angry about? That the hierarchy has been disrupted because the youngster has come up and elbowed out the older, but the older wasn't interested. If the older had wanted, she would have stood her ground. She'd probably be happy to hand off this boob to somebody else. There had always been a simmering sibling rivalry between Ethel and Pat, a competitive spirit between two sisters who were three years apart, chronologically, and worlds apart in terms of their intellect and personalities. On the surface, though, they appeared devoted. It was a neat sisterly relationship, as one classmate put it, but Ethel felt that she could never live up to Pat's near-perfect image at home and at school. All Ethel could ever say on the subject of Pat and Bobby was that they, quote, fell in love and he went with her for two years. That statement, though, as an exaggeration, made a quarter of a century later a sop of sorts to Pat, who by then had distanced herself from the Skakel family by making a permanent life for herself in Ireland. Bobby soon became a presence around Manhattanville, coming down from Harvard to pick up Ethel for weekend dates. We used to tease her if we happened to be around when he came to take her out, said Mamie Jenkins. Being silly college girls, we'd giggle and make fun, and Ethel pretended to be upset, but she was flattered that we knew that she was going out with a Kennedy. Said Anne Marie O'Hagan Murphy, Ethel was head over heels in love with Bobby. That's all she talked about and wanted. She couldn't wait for the weekend so that she could see Bobby. As soon as she started going with him, it was Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. It was Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. And not much skakel anymore. By the beginning of Ethel's junior year and Bobby's senior year, the two were going steady. Ethel was telling friends that she intended to marry Bobby, even though their formal engagement would not be announced until six months after her graduation. After every weekend, giggled Kay Simpson Waterbury, we'd all go scrambling up to Ethel's room at college and get all the details about whatever happened. Sexual activity was unheard of. We'd talk about sex, but in such a naive way. Ethel talked about kissing and holding hands and stuff like that. Despite their infatuation, Ethel and Bobby weren't exactly models of youthful, fiery passion. Hand-holding was the closest anyone ever saw of their affection and attachment. In terms of love and romance, Bobby was puritanical. Ethel, prudish. They appeared caring, but not physically. More like siblings, who were extraordinarily close, rather than two young people in love. Bobby was at the Skakels virtually every weekend now, tutoring Ethel and her Manhattanville chums on American history, despite the fact that he was no quiz kid himself. Bobby was very helpful when he came into the picture, recalled Kay Simpson Waterbury. We'd be up there in Greenwich, and he'd sit on the couch, and we'd sit around him and cram for our tests and essays. It was something we looked forward to. He was terrific help because he made the subject so realistic and engaging. How interesting. Okay, now we really do have to stop because I must go fix breakfast for the family. But the next chapter is called Wild Child. <laughs> but what? What? What wild child? Which wild child? I don't know. Then the next chapter is called Homecoming Queen. Then we have Bobby's Fling, whatever in the world that means. I can only hope it's something good. And then the last chapter of College Girl is called Don't Look Back. So those four epi- those four chapters will be in the next episode. Um, thank you guys for letting me read that last chapter. I know I didn't say at the beginning that's what we were doing, but... I just had to know. And, you know, this is just, this is very interesting. I don't know why I thought that the beginning of the relationship was like, but not this. But I do think that in the last episode, we had talked about how part of Ethel's devotion to the Catholic Church, I think, came from her need for foundation and structure because her family offered her none of it. And I think part of the reason she was so attracted to the Kennedys is for the same reason that her brothers were appalled by the Kennedys. I think it's their clannishness. I think she liked that. I think that she liked the fact that there was structure and everything. And in the last episode, too, remember how she said that when she went over to their house, it was neat and tidy and people had thought about what it would be like to be a guest at their home and had tried to provide the niceties to make it a pleasant stay. Well, that wasn't happening at her house where there's a pack of 15 dogs that'll attack you walking up the driveway or try to drown you when you're in the pool. And so I think that for her, whether she was deeply in love with Bobby or not initially, I think she would have clung to that with both hands and teeth because she wanted to be part of something that seemed settled, something that seemed like they had, you know, walls around them. And the clan element of the Kennedys, I think, was as alluring to her as anything else could have possibly been. So I'm very interested to see the way this works out. And I really want to know, when does Bobby suddenly take a turn towards the more carnal elements of his personality because up until this point it seems like he's over there you know kneeling with a rosary in his hands and very puritanical about his sex life um, and isn't crossing any boundaries with Ethel which you know good for them 
But when does it happen where he gets married and then decides to start breaking some boundaries? What happened to Bobby Kennedy? I have questions and I can't wait for them to be answered. What about you guys? All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I so appreciate all of you guys and I'll see you later this week. Bye.